Welcome up everyone. It's fantastic to have you all here today for our National Road Safety Partnership Program webinar called Transition to the New Chain of Responsibility. Are you complying? This webinar is proudly brought to you by the NRSPP in partnership with the Australian Road Research Board and Holding Redlick. Next slide. Thanks, Jeff. My name is Rosemary Patterson and I'll be your co-moderator this session. I'm here to provide tech support if required and field questions. Next slide, thanks. I'm joined by Jerome Carslake, who manages the NRSPP and its many activities. Welcome, Jerome. Thank you, Rosemary. And for anyone joining us for the first time, could you tell us a little more about the NRSPP and its purpose? Certainly, my pleasure. Uh, the NRSVP has been established to provide a collaborative network for Australian businesses and organisations to help them create a positive road safety culture, both internally and externally. It aims to help organisations of all sizes across all sectors that share and build road safety initiatives specific to their own workplace and beyond. It is delivered by ARB and funded primarily by Government Coalition and ARB. So for more information and more tools like this webinar, please refer to the NRSVP website. And I know this will be a great webinar, knowing Jeff and how COR is a hot topic. So looking forward to it. Fantastic. Thank you. Next slide. Thanks, Jeff. Before we start, we'd like to uh, show those who are new to webinars how to have a quick look at the webinar tools. And today's webinar will go for approximately 60 minutes with question time included. If we get more questions than we can answer, we will be able to respond by email. We'll be recording the session and we'll share the recording. Next slide. Thanks, Jeff. Webinars work best when they're interactive, so please feel free to ask any questions or share your experiences along the way. You can type them into the questions box there you see on your screen. If you experience any technical glitches, please use the raise your hand function and we'll be able to assist you. Now, the best part, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Jeff Barnsworth to the studio today. Jeff is one of Australia's leading transport and commodities lawyers with 25 years experience in the field. He's been recognised in Chambers Asia Pacific for providing strategic and effective legal advice and has been listed in Best Lawyers in Australia as a leading lawyer in the categories Shipping and Maritime Law and Trade Law since 2013 and editor for the COR Advisor publication. So welcome, Jeff. And you're not in the studio, you're interstate. <laughs> welcome. Well, thank you, Rosemary, and thank you, um, everyone, for, for dialling in to uh, participate um, in this webinar. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and, and hopefully um, get a chance to answer some of your questions and, and give you a bit of background, or I guess, an introduction, um, some things to think about uh, for the changes that are coming um, down the line to the uh, what we all know as the chain of responsibility by virtue of these amendments to the heavy vehicle um, national law. Um, most of you will know, um, uh, if you've been reading uh, the COR Advisor publication, you will have um, already got some good information about it, but you'll be aware that the, uh, the law is changing, COR um, is changing. As far as we know at the moment, um, those changes will probably come into effect around the middle of next year. Uh, so that means that really for the next year or so, um, you've both got to keep your eye out in respect of compliance with the law as it currently stands um, and also start thinking about what you need to do in respect of compliance with the changes um, when they come into, into force around the middle of next year. So the purpose of this webinar really is to outline um, the, the changes um, that are coming, uh, share some thoughts with you at this stage about um, what you might want to do about um, um, compliance and answer any questions um, that you may have um, as a result of, of anything that um, I have to say uh, this afternoon. So leaping right into it, um, I guess the changes are, I think, quite significant. Um, the changes have been uh, broadly described, I suppose, as uh, being for the benefit of the industry uh, in that some felt uh, that the current law was too prescriptive um, in relation to 
prohibiting, um, expressly prohibiting um, certain activities. Uh, the defence, um, or the only defence um, uh, that was available was the uh, all reasonable steps defence, which um, some of you will be familiar with. Um, that was considered to be a very high bar, it was a very high bar um, to satisfy. Um, so that has changed, the onus of proof has changed, it's now on the regulator um, to prove, or the prosecutor, um, to prove the breaches rather than um, the respondents to prove that they didn't commit any breaches. There's a bunch of new concepts um, like the primary duty um, uh, which are important. I think one of the most uh, significant differences though, um, and we can talk about this uh, as we go on, uh, is the um, effect that this is likely to have on um, executives, executive officers of corporations. Um, and I think it really puts them in the crosshairs uh, now in a way that they um, never were before. Um, that includes the potential for jail time um, in respect of certain breaches. And I actually think that if I sort of look back over the last couple of years, um, there probably have been incidents which, if they were to happen um, after the law changes, uh, could result in um, directors uh, of companies and uh, executive officers going to jail. But we'll talk about that um, a little bit more. So if you see the slide on the screen there, that's the summary. Um, it's this concept of, of primary duties. Um, it echoes the, the work health and safety law and the, the, the rail um, safety national law. And that primary duty is um, to, so far as reasonably practicable, um, to ensure the safety um, of transport activities carried out by um, the, the organisation. As I mentioned before, um, executive officers are now um, required to exercise due diligence to ensure that transport operations are compliant with the legislation. Um, and executive officers may now be convicted um, even if the company um, has not been uh, prosecuted. The other significant change is that the penalties um, have gone up. Uh, an individual, in addition to getting a criminal conviction, um, can be liable to a fine of between fifty and three hundred thousand dollars, and or five years imprisonment in extreme um, circumstances. Uh, and corporations, uh, the fine has commensurately increased from um, to five hundred to five hundred thousand to, to three million dollars. So, you know, the regulator is is sending a very clear message. Um, I think that uh, we've had basically 10 years to get used to this concept of the chain of responsibility. Uh, I am still um, constantly surprised by how many people still don't have their head around um, the chain of responsibility or are even aware um, that there is such a thing and that they should be complying with it. People who really should know after the course of 10 years. And these aren't people who are um, necessarily uh, bad and, and, and avoiding um, the, the legislation. They just genuinely don't know about it and they don't know that it applies to, to what they do. Um, and I, I suppose the changes that, that, that are coming down now are really stepping up um, the, the, the potential, the, the penalties. And it, it really is, we're now sort of in the, in the stage where there are no, no excuses, um, I think, uh, for non-compliance. The nature of the offences and the obligations has changed, as I mentioned in the introduction. So the, 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 the four, um, mass loading, fatigue and speeding, um, have changed from uh, a must not uh, obligation to a now a positive must ensure obligation. That's going to have, or potentially that will have, um, uh, an impact on, on compliance and policies. What sort of policies um, do you need to have in place? And what what documentation do you need to be able to produce to prove um, to the regulator that you have ensured um, uh, that you've done all of these things? 
Um, the reasonable defense, the all reasonable steps defense, as I mentioned, has um, been swept away. Um, and we are now left with the um, unless reasonable excuse um, defense, the onus being um, on the uh, prosecution. So that's just by way of introduction and summary. Are there any, um, I know it's early on, but are there any questions that, that anyone has at this early stage? So I've got a question for you. Um, we had quite a lot of rumbling a couple of years ago about maintenance. Where, where does that sort of land in the new, in the new uh, uh, chain responsibility? Um, maintenance, um, if we have a look at what the, um, the obligations in relation to transport activities are, um, and transport activities are defined um, as uh, activities including business practices and making decisions associated with the use of a heavy vehicle on a road, including, for example, um, and it lists a number of things uh, that are required um, as, as part of transport activities. Maintenance isn't expressly included in that list, but it could easily be, um, it could easily fall within, um, at a higher level, one of the obligations um, within that list, I think. Okay. And I saw you had me had individuals and, and corporations, different sort of scales of penalties in there. Where does, where does a sub, subcontractor sit in there? Well, a subcontractor, um, do you mean the, 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 the person or the corporation? Well, I guess in some cases, say, say you're, a, I guess, a, a small or medium operator um, and maybe you've got maybe 10 trucks or, or 8 trucks. What sort of scale, what sort of risk is there to those? It, should they actually be penalised? Well, um, if you're sort of alluding to the question about, um, uh, I suppose, business practices and also what is um, uh, necessary, I suppose, in terms of um, demonstrating that you've taken all steps that are reasonably practicable. Um, the, the, the last element of that, um, the reasonably practicable sort of definition in the Act, includes one of, as one of the considerations um, the cost associated with the available ways um, to be compliant, including whether the cost is grossly disproportionate to the likelihood of the risk or damage. So in, in, in deciding um, what is reasonably practicable in, in relation to a particular duty, there will be um, an element of, of considering, you know, toll might have a higher standard, for example, than a smaller subcontractor, which I suppose is um, slightly awkward um, in some respects because it, it, that's a bit of a trade-off um, in that you should, as a road user, um, expect all, all vehicles to be equally safe. Um, you shouldn't necessarily um, expect that, that toll vehicles are safer than any other vehicle. I suppose it just sets the bar at a certain point and it requires individuals to do um, as much as they can reasonably, do whatever is reasonably practical in, in their circumstances. And I, I guess I've got a question here. How will the changes affect the consigners from Chris? Um, well, the consigners will still will continue. I mean, the consigners are still um, parties in the chain of responsibility. Um, let me. How about I, I, I press on? Yep. And, you know, maybe Chris's question will be sort of will be answered. And if it hasn't been answered by the end, I can um, come back and and sort of go into that in a little bit more detail. Excellent. Let's get into it. So, I wanted to just sort of talk about um, the message of the regulator. And what I think um, the regulator is doing um, in relation to these amendments uh, to the chain of responsibility. And I really think that they are saying that it's up to um, the board and the executive um, of a corporation to set out, the, to define the, the company's corporate culture in relation to safety, um, to the extent that if there is a breach um, of that corporate culture, you can't necessarily hide um, behind the, the, the corporate veil, um, as we as we call it. You really are finding that you are, as an individual, um, significantly exposed and, and will be responsible if you can't um, demonstrate that you have uh, exercised your own um, due diligence, I suppose, 
um, to uh, set the culture, to, to set the safety culture um, of a, a company. It imposes a positive obligation um, on directors. Uh, the, one of the new, um, I suppose, the new principles uh, that is introduced um, into the Act expressly is Section 26A um, of, the, of the new legislation, which sets up the principle of shared responsibility. And it may well be that, that as you look at that um, principle of, of shared responsibility, you assume that it means shared along the, the, the chain of responsibility or the supply chain, um, as it were, uh, horizontally. Um, but it's equally, I think, saying that it's uh, a shared responsibility between corporations and individuals um, uh, in a way that it wasn't uh, expressly um, before. And what um, the executive um, of a company uh, is now required to be able to demonstrate um, when the regulator comes knocking uh, is that they have uh, exercised due diligence. Um, uh, and that is defined um, helpfully, or, or it's an inclusive um, definition of, of due diligence at section 26D13. And it's worth just looking at those things because it requires that you take reasonable steps to acquire and keep up to date um, knowledge about the safe conduct of transport activities, to gain an understanding of the nature of the legal entity's transport activities. And if we're going to pause there, um, if you're a, a smaller company um, and you are involved in transport, your transport business, you would expect that most of the people on the board would have a relatively good grasp of, of transport activities because that's the nature of your business. But to come back to Chris's question um, about well, how is this going to impact on consignors and consignees, transport might be a peripheral um, aspect of, of what they do. They might be a retailer, for example. Um, so they might be really focused on branding, uh, real estate, leasing properties or, or doing whatever. They don't necessarily, um, they, they may not necessarily see um, transport activities as being part of their core business. But they need to now, um, I suppose, is the change um, that this uh, brings about. And a sort of a, 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 as a sidebar to that, there is this continuing issue about, well, how much information um, does a board get and how much information does a board need um, about um, the, the company's transport operations. The effect of, of, of these amendments really escalate that um, quite substantially, I think. So it requires um, the executives of the company to be able to demonstrate that they have gained an understanding of um, uh, the nature of the, the legal entity's transport activities and the hazards and risks, including the public risk associated with those activities. They must ensure that the legal entity has um, and uses appropriate resources to eliminate or minimise those hazards and risks, and to ensure that the legal entity has and implements processes um, to eliminate or minimise those hazards or risks uh, for receiving, considering and responding in a timely way to information about those hazards and risks and any incidents, um, and for complying with the legal entity's duty under Section 26C, which is that primary um, duty of care that I mentioned. One of the uh, issues that I've written about recently and, and sort of thinking about how this is all going to um, play out in practice is a situation where um, you may have uh, an executive officer, you may have the, the transport or logistics manager of, of the business. Um, who is not satisfied with the amount of resources he or she is being given um, by the company to comply with his or her or the company's chain of responsibility obligations. Given that that person is now exposed to quite serious potential penalties, what are they to do? Um, how do they raise that with the, um, the corporation? Uh, they, you, uh, one of the 
sections that I just mentioned required that there be um, uh, sorry that there must be processes for receiving, considering and responding in a timely way to information about those hazards. So it raises the question of whether companies need to have some sort of whistleblower protection, I think, for um, their executives. So, or any, any employee who might be concerned about aspects, safety aspects of the company's transport operations. Anyway, these are um, the sorts of issues, I think, that, that are, you know, we're just really sort of working our way through um, how this is going to apply. And it is, I suppose, why, yes, it, it's 12 months, I suppose, until, we, um, until this is going to come into force around the country. But it is really something that, that we need to start thinking about now. And just going back to my slide, um, the other thing to, that you're going to have to be able to do or a company is going to have to be able to do is prove um, that it actually went through these processes. Um, largely, I suppose, a, a risk analysis. So someone sat down, they conducted a risk analysis of the company. Um, where are the potential exposures in relation to um, the, the chain of responsibility? And what is being done about that? And if you can't produce that evidence um, when asked, it's going to be very difficult to prove that you've complied or that you've exercised the due diligence that's required. So um, I might come back to that a little bit later on, but um, uh, I think that that reinforces to me that the regulator sees that it is the job of the executives of businesses to take the lead and be responsible um, for uh, building that corporate culture. Um, uh, of safety um, and attention to the chain of responsibility obligations within the company. Uh, the other changes, um, the, the more, I suppose, the more specific changes, um, we've got mass dimension and loading. Uh, the current responsibilities, as I mentioned at the very beginning, were prescriptive. There was a prohibition um, on doing um, certain things subject to being able to satisfy uh, that all reasonable steps had been taken. Um, that has um, been changed to the uh, the primary duty um, obligation. Um, so instead of the all reasonable steps defence, the parties must ensure that the vehicle complies unless the person has a reasonable excuse. The other aspect, um, which is uh, is fatigue. Uh, current responsibilities, um, driver duties, a person must not drive while fatig a fatigue regulated heavy vehicle on a road while the person is fatigued and then other parties in the chain um, uh, are responsible for taking all reasonable steps to ensure that a person does not drive the vehicle on a road. The fines there as you can see are relatively paltry um, by comparison to the fines that, that are now um, coming down the line. So from the commencement of the new law um, driver duties and penalties are unchanged except the reasonable steps defence is admitted. There is no defence for a driver's breach of fatigue duties. Party in the chain duties omitted. Obligation of parties in the chain to prevent fatigue offences is now covered only by the new section 26E. And there are various amendments to the work diary requirements. Speeding was dealt with under Chapter 5 of the, of the current law. Um, it imposes duties and penalties on parties in the in the chain of responsibility to ensure that speed limits are not excited, ch uh, exceeded. Chapter 5, um, speeding is omitted and all speeding provisions and offences are now covered by the primary duty um, provisions that I've been talking about in sections 26C um, and 26E. The duties of each party in the chain of responsibility um, as we've mentioned, there were separate offences and separate penalties um, for uh, mass dimension, loading, speed and fatigue covered by the, the, the all reasonable steps defence. We've now got the new section um, 26C, which is the primary um, duty section. Um, and that requires each party, um, so far as is reasonably practicable, um, to eliminate and minimise public risks and not directly or indirectly cause or encourage a driver or other COR party to contravene the heavy vehicle national law or exceed a speed limit. Each party in the chain of responsibility must ensure, so far as is reasonably practicable, the safety of the party's transport activities. 
such as contracting a person to drive or maintain, repair the vehicle, packing and unlo loading goods, receiving and un uh, receiving unloaded goods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then in re relation to penalties, we've we've had a look at those um, already. So, do any have any questions in relation to what I've just been through? Oh, we do indeed. We do indeed. So, first question here, um, and I guess this is probably just a bit of context. Um, Arthur's asking, are there specifications on what size vehicles this that chain response really applies to? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's, so far as I'm aware, it's not changed um, from the, the definition of, of heavy vehicle um, uh, as applied under the previous law. So it hasn't got any bigger and it hasn't got any smaller. Excellent. Um, how will this how will this affect freight brokers by ash? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, well, it 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 it, it depends on um, whether freight freight brokers um, fall within, uh, you know, whether they can be said to fall within the chain of responsibility. Uh, you know, are they a scheduler, for example? Um, Arguably, they, they might be, um, but you know I, they're a, they're a fairly um, I suppose intrinsic you know part of the or member of the the, the chain of responsibility. Um, the only other thing I suppose that they could be um, uh, well they're not really a consigner or a consignee. Look, I, I, if they were. Um, if they could be defined fall within the definition of a scheduler, um, then yes, they probably would be um, within the, the, the chain of responsibility. But the difficulty, I suppose, is that, um, well, no, I suppose schedulers are the same. Schedulers aren't necessarily party um, to, the, to the actual transport contract itself, the, the movement of the goods from A to B, but then neither are schedulers. So look, I'd, I mean, if I, was advising a shed, uh, if I was advising a freight broker, I'd say, look, you know, you, 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 you may well be captured. You probably are. It, it feels like you should be um, in some respects. Why wouldn't you, um, uh, you know, at the very least, you, you, you probably have some influence over the terms of the contracts that are being entered into. Um, and you've still got an obligation, I think, probably to, to make sure that those contracts contain appropriate provisions in relation to um, speed, mass and fatigue, and that sort of thing. So uh, if I was a prudent and cautious um, broker, I would be making sure that I had um, some form of compliance program. That's a great question. Um, got, a, got a good another uh, two here. So Chris, I, I like a, a real world one like this one. We are an electrical construction company. We may order some cable from a supplier, and that supplier may engage a company to deliver that cable. How far down the line does the chain of responsibility go? Because uh, much of our operation is out of our control. Well, um, could you just start that question again, Jerome? Certainly. Um, so we are an electrical uh, construction company. We may order some cable from a supplier, and that supplier may engage a company to deliver that cable. How far yeah, down I, the line? If I can just come back, you, you're, um, it sounds to me like you're a cons, potentially a consignor um, oh, in that yes. case. You may also be a loading manager if, if goods are um, being unloaded at premises that you operate. Uh, it is a good question and it's a difficult one, particularly in relation to fatigue. Um, what obligations do you have uh, if deliveries, uh, if, if heavy vehicles are coming to your sites or sites over which you've got some control, um, and those drivers are, are clearly affected by fatigue, um, that is probably um, yeah, that's probably the main area where you have an issue. You may have an, an issue with load securing as well um, to make sure that um, the, uh, the as as I mentioned, you're probably you may well be a loading manager. Um, in that the, in the, the goods are discharged at your at, at your premises or premises that you're you're operating or have some control over. So yeah, look, you I, I understand that all you're doing is picking up. Well, here's another point. Um, if you pick up the phone um, to order goods, and those goods are then delivered on a on a heavy vehicle. Uh, 
Um, arguably, um, and I'm not aware of any cases that have that have actually determined this sort of thing. You've got to have some sort of terms of consignment. Um, terms of consignment is a is a slightly nebulous concept which exists under the law at the moment. Um, and what are what exactly are terms of consignment? Uh, once again, if I was advising you on on how to go about complying with your um, obligations under the under both the current law and certain of the law that, that that's coming, um, I'd be suggesting that you have a a policy that you have a chain of responsibility policy, um, and that policy would need to be pushed out to your customers. Um, you probably, and that, that would simply, well, that would be that, that you know, you expect your, your suppliers to be compliant with the, the heavy vehicle national law and you reserve the right to sort of audit um, compliance if, if necessary, but a more, a, a, possibly a more um, sort of serious concern is, as I say, what happens if a, what happens if a driver turns up at one of your sites and he's clearly affected by fatigue? What do you have an obligation to do anything um, in relation to that? And I suspect, particularly under the new um, chain of responsibility, you do. And you probably have an obligation to, to pick up the phone to your supplier and say, look, this guy that delivered the, the, the cables was you know, out of it uh, or, or appeared to be fatigued or, or whatever. So I think there is an obligation. There's certainly an obligation on the receiver of, of any goods these days um, if they think that, that, that a driver appears to be fatigued. And, and I understand um, absolutely that that's a very difficult thing to do. How, how do you, um, as an electrician, say, make a judgment about whether someone appears to be fatigued? That's something that you might have to have a look at um, th there is some guidance in the current um, in the current version of the law about the appearance of fatigue, um, and it may well be that that's something that, that that you are obliged and required to do. I hope that I know it's a I know it's a difficult it's a difficult scenario um, because you do feel that a lot of these things are outside your control, but the fact is um, that consignors um, and consignees have um, obligations under the law, even if they are not the people who actually book the freight that, that moves the, the goods. I guess the other question, just drawing on that, um, if you make that request because you're concerned about a driver, are you, should you be following up as well to make sure that the supplier took action on that? Uh, I, I would say um, it's a bit like the question that I'm often asked about audit. You know, okay, so you say we should be auditing compliance. How often do we have to audit compliance? And my answer to that is, well, if you audit it and you find non-compliance, you've got to audit it again. Um, and you basically continue auditing it until you find that there is a, a state of compliance. Um, and once you are satisfied that, that the people that you're dealing with, whether in your own organisation or your customers, are compliant, then you can maybe step back the compliance in audits um, to annually or, or semi-annually, whatever what is, whatever is appropriate to your business. So to come back to that question, Jerome, um, in particular, if you ring up your supplier and say, "Look, mate, you know the, the bloke who delivered that 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 cable, um, you know he looked he looked pretty sleepy to me, and I'm I'm you know I'm not you know we're we're next to a school, and I don't want him running over any kids." Um, uh, if if the guy on the other end of the phone takes that information seriously, I'd be I'd probably be satisfied with that. Um, if the next driver who, who comes is similarly fatigued, I would have, I'd start to have an issue with that. Mm. Um, anyway, look, it just, That's it's, right. it, it's a question of, a lot of this is as much about evidence, being able to evidence that you've taken these steps. Um, it's not just, it's not just paperwork. It's not just sort of having a policy for policy's sake. If you have um, gone through this exercise and if you have, Sort of done the risk analysis that I've, I've described, and if there is an incident, you can produce that. You can say, "Well, we did the risk analysis. Uh, we're an electrical cabling business. We have to order these these heavy vehicles. Um, we we have run this analysis. This is what we found. Our, one of our biggest risks is um, heavy vehicles arriving on site with fatigued drivers and or with um, the uh, the the cables the the in in inappropriately or inadequately secured. This is what we've done about it." 
um, we've, we've got a policy, we, we push that out to our, our suppliers and we expect them to comply with it and so far um, we're satisfied that they have been um, compliant. Excellent. I must say, good questions, great answer. And just before we move on, I've got one good question here from Andrew which relates to the section that we're in at the moment. In relation to section 26C, is a company liable if they do not adopt a new technology like IVMS? <laughs> well, I think that comes down to they're not they're not they're not going to be liable um, because they haven't done it. They're going to be liable if they haven't even considered it. Or sorry, I'll take that back. They won't be liable if they haven't considered it. Um, they they're more likely to be liable if they haven't considered it. If they have considered it and said, look, at the moment we've only got a limited size fleet, it's too expensive, we've got, we'll have got, we do these other, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it in another way, um, then I think you'd be, then think you'd be fine. Um, it's, if you haven't even looked at it, if you haven't even run the risk analysis and, 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 and looked at um, uh, telematics, for example, as, as, a, as a method of, of managing um, uh, some of these issues, then you're more likely to be in trouble because it just suggests that you haven't exercised due diligence. It's fine if you exercise due diligence, make the inquiry and decide not to do it for, for a perfectly good reason. But if you haven't even considered it, um, you're potentially exposed. And sorry if I can take one, you know, the, 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 the footnote to that is, if you haven't even considered it or documented the fact that you've considered it, which is equally important. Excellent. Thanks. We have another question, but I'll hold that over to the, to the next uh, question session. Okay. Um, look, I, I spoke um, a little bit um, about uh, the, the obligations of executive um, officers. Uh, I don't necessarily need to um, repeat what I said earlier on, other than to say uh, I think if you take nothing else away from this um, webinar, uh, the the obligations and responsibilities on executive officers is going to change quite substantially, um, and you need to start thinking about um, a compliance framework uh, for your executive officers. Um, so that's it, it's sort of said. I, I discussed it earlier on. Um, I, You'll see there on the slide that you know, due diligence includes taking reasonable steps to know about the safe conduct of transport activities. Um, and, and to use the example, sorry, I've forgotten the name of the, the, the guy who asked the question, but the electrical um, contractor. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good example of someone who's, who's they're, not necess they're not in the transport business. Uh, they rely on, on heavy vehicle transport, but they're not in the transport business. So in doing, um, performing that sort of risk analysis, uh, they have to think a little bit outside the box, and there may even be a, um, uh, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Is that the right phrase? But you know, you may be surprised by what you find out when you run the risk analysis about the number of, of you know, the interactions that you do have with heavy vehicle transport that could put you in the, the, the chain of responsibility and, and create an obligation on the on you under the chain of responsibility. Um, the other um, the other point, obviously, that is that the executive may be convicted, um, prosecuted, and convicted even if the company has not been prosecuted. Um, anyway, look, I, as I say, if you, if you take nothing else away from today, um, I think that's I think that's probably the most significant um, change uh, that, that's coming. The maximum penalties, well, that's I suppose another um, relatively significant change um, that's coming. Uh, I did mention um, that there have been, I think, incidents in the last um, couple of years which could have seen um, individuals go to jail. Um, there have been a couple of incidents in, uh, in New South Wales in particular where people have been killed um, in heavy vehicle incidents where I think there is a, um, a case uh, where the, that an individual um, has been reckless um, in their attention to compliance with or reckless non-compliance with chain of responsibility and if um, RMS in New South Wales had the uh, capacity to send people to jail I suspect they would have um, given it a go. Um, on that point I suppose 
Um, there is a uh, compliance on the compliance or the enforcement piece generally. Um, it, it has been, um, and I mentioned at the beginning that there's still quite a there's a level of ignorance about the chain of responsibility, which I find surprising. Um, it possibly because um, I'm based in New South Wales, and the regulator in New South Wales, RMS, has been uh, quite probably the most active um, uh, in terms of uh, enforcement of compliance. Um, other states haven't been um, quite so active in terms of compliance. I don't know whether that will change, but um, it's something to bear in mind. I think you know most people, uh, many heavy vehicle businesses uh, that operate nationally, that vehicles are going to go through New South Wales at some point, largely. If you operate exclusively in um, Victoria, count yourself lucky um, from an enforcement point of view. Um, but if you travel anywhere near South Wales, then you've got to be extra, I think, extra careful about um, compliance. Um, the, in, in relation to defences, I also mentioned um, at the beginning of this call that um, we had this thing called the All Reasonable Steps Defence, which um, I know we've got 18 months or so to go, um, has never yet been no, no one's ever yet made it. No one's ever um, succeeded on an all reasonable steps defence. Not that I'm aware of. Sorry, I should add. There may have been cases that have slipped under the radar that I haven't noticed. Um, but I'm not aware of anyone succeeding on, on an all reasonable steps defence. So that's not going to be missed by anyone, I, I suspect, in the industry. It's been replaced um, by the, the primary duty um, and the obligation to be able to demonstrate when asked that um, so far as is reasonably um, practicable you have um, ensured the safety of your of your the transport activities of your company, so that's the that's a new way of, of framing it. It makes it it probably does make it harder for the regulator um, for the for the prosecution. Um, it uh, it means that they will probably um, make not that they haven't been slow, but they'll probably make more use of their powers to issue notices requiring production of documents. Um, so that they can establish the extent to which you've been um, compliant. And the other thing that I should mention is that there's a a, um, an, a renewed focus um, on industry industry codes of practice. Uh, now, an industry code, there is some debate um, going on in the in the in the industry about what exactly is um, an industry code of practice and and how do they how do they work. If you go to the NHVR website, that's the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator website, there's quite a lot of information, quite a lot of good information on there about um, codes of con industry codes of conduct. So I think um, as part of a compliance piece and, and thinking about what you might do in the next sort of 12 to 18 months in respect of compliance, if you are in um, a particular industry uh, and, you know, the, the Electrical cables, you know, is, is probably an, an example um, of of an industry that that has, um, uh, I think, had a code of um, conduct in the past, and possibly uh, might want to think about uh, dusting that off and and seeing whether it's you know making sure that it's compliant and relevant for um, the changes that are that are coming down the pipe. So there's any number of industries, I suppose. There's you know the, the grain, agriculture, probably cotton any number of um, retail, uh, um, forestry, uh, just to name a few, um, that could benefit, I think, from giving some thought. And I know the regulator is actually out promoting to um, at various industry group gatherings um, and promoting uh, that they, they think about um, chain of, uh, the putting together a, a code of conduct. So any more questions? Certainly. Um, let's kick this one off here from Frank. Um, how do you actually measure the culture of a company? Well, um, I guess what you would do is you would, I mean, I always, I, the starting point is having a policy, right? I mean, well, I think the starting point now 
um, is doing the risk analysis, is doing the risk assessment. Okay, there is this thing called chain of responsibility. Uh, we think we might be in the chain of responsibility. Um, can we do a risk analysis and work out, okay, we've got these trucks that bring goods or collect goods from our warehouses um, or, or whatever. So you, you, you run your risk analysis. Uh, basis on that risk analysis, you should probably have a policy. You should have a, a corporate policy, very much like companies have safety policies. If you go to a lot of companies' websites, there will be um, um, uh, a safety policy, a health and safety policy on the website. Uh, so you have that policy. The question then is whether that policy is just a dry document that nobody really pays any attention to, or whether um, it is actively complied with and people really believe um, in the existence of that. Now, how do you measure that? Um, you probably measure that by, if I walked into someone's site and I saw signs on the wall, um, I would think, okay, well, they're taking this seriously. You know, often I'll go into people's business premises and there'll be safety um, signs on the wall. That shows that they're taking it, you know, that that's at least a first step. Is there a mechanism within the organisation for dealing with incidents and near misses? So um, if, if people feel, and this comes back to the point I made about, you know, information, is there a number for someone to ring? If, if someone, a someone, member of your staff um, feels that, that, that there's an incident or they've seen something which, which concerns them, is there someone for them to feed that back to? Is there a, and, and is that call then logged and followed up? So there's a number of ways that um, I think you can, you can measure um, the culture um, of a company. That's great, good answer, thanks for that, Jeff. Um, got a question here from Chris. Uh, I think it's just drawing on a previous one. If I order a fridge from Bing Lee and it gets delivered by a heavy vehicle, I am part of the chain responsibility. How far do you go with it? Yeah, look, that's a that's a very good question. Um, I suppose that then comes back to uh, your due diligence obligations. <laughs> um, I would like to think that as the person who has ordered a fridge from Bing Lee, the regulator might not put you too high um, on on his list. Um, of, in, in, of enforcement, but look, I, I take the point. Um, uh, actually, well, I suppose if you've, I guess the question is, just looking here at the definition of business practices. Business practices of a person means the person's practices in running a business associated with the use of a heavy vehicle on a road. Not sure that, um, ordering a fridge from Bing Lee means that you are running a business associated with the use of a heavy vehicle on a road. Um, going back to the electrical cable question earlier on, maybe that's even um, becoming slightly line ball, but you know, if you rely on, you know, if you're ordering deliveries at, at various sites several days a week, it's a much closer link, I suppose, to the chain of responsibility than, than the, the guy ordering from Bing Lee. Great. I've um, got two more questions here, then we'll move on because we're coming towards the end and then we've got another four slides to go. Um, can This one's from Greg. Can will the regulators investigate transport users like retailers for COI compliance even if an incident has not occurred? Uh, my understanding is that, look, without getting sidetracked, um, the way that, that New South Wales has, has done it Obviously, um, there's a lot of there's a lot in the chain of responsibility, right? There's, it means that thousands of companies um, around Australia have compliance obligations, and it's not possible for the regulators to audit every business in Australia. They just don't have the manpower um, to do any of that. So what they've done in New South Wales is they've responded to acute incidents. So if a truck runs off the road and, and kills someone, um, they will, or, or if there is, you know, they'll deal with acute incidents of, of speeding or fatigue or, or, or whatever. In the background, running sort of in parallel to that, they have um, uh, targeted, if you like, um, industry sectors. So for an example, I know they targeted waste, waste um, management um, businesses um, in the last sort of 12 months. So they will go into, and I know they, they, they targeted grain companies um, a couple of years ago now. So look, they will, they will 
of their own volition go in and um, audit uh, um, compliance. I know um, that both Coles and Woolworths, for example, um, may not be perfect, but they do have quite a, um, a strong focus on compliance. So they, um, I don't know this for a fact, but I suspect that they would be in, in reasonably regular contact with the regulators um, about their, their level of compliance and compliance systems. Excellent, thanks for that. Um, and last question here before we move on is from Ash. We, get, we often get owner drivers knocking on our door to work with us directly without the carrier in the middle. What's the risk for us in such a case? Are we considered a carrier? Oh, Ash is the, is Ash the freight broker? I believe so, yes. Um, look, the, what I have, and I'll try and answer this quickly because we are running out of time. People often have um, a primary carrier that they use. If that carrier can't do the business for them, they have a secondary carrier. Um, and if they can't help because it's a, a, a job at an odd hour in an odd place, um, they might just pick up the phone and get anyone that can do it. It's that third um, level um, of people that I think pose the greatest risk of danger um, because you don't know them that well, they don't know you that well, they don't understand what your you, you don't really know their their you know their attitude towards compliance, whereas the people that you deal with on a on a, a more regular basis, you do understand um, their that they understand what the chain of responsibility is, and also there's a relationship there, so they don't want to stuff you around, you don't want to stuff them around. So it really is in that third tier, I think, where the danger um, lies. And I appreciate that you can't you know you can't not use these people, you can't not give them business if, if you've got really no other option. Um, but there is a risk. Um, and I think that was the question, is there a risk? Uh, then yes, I think that's where there is a risk. And just to say, I think that was a great answer, Jeff. And Ash agreed and said many thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Ash. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, then just sort of moving on to the to the final slides because I know um, we're running out of time um, pretty quickly. Uh, so with container weight declarations, um, penalties are unchanged. The new obligation, each consigner or packer of the goods must ensure so far as it's reasonably practical that the weight of the container does not exceed the maximum gross weight marks. Uh, keeping relevant documentation, um, keep it. Um, if I can summarise that slide. Um, and just finally, um, I think, uh, oh no, I've got a couple of, one more, two more slides to go. Um, and this is an example of the due diligence activity that actually comes from the explanatory memorandum to the new Act. And I've been, this is sort of consistent what I've been saying um, all the way along. Develop a, you've really got to develop a safety management plan. You've got to perform that risk analysis that I've, uh, I've mentioned. Where are we? Where do we come in contact with the chain of responsibility? And how are we going to manage um, those responsibilities? Make information readily available. So that's something I haven't really spoken about. But, and it comes back to the question that was asked about how do you measure, a, how do you describe or measure a, a company's culture? Training um, is not going to be an important part of that as well. So. Yes, putting up signs on the walls, that's important. But those who are at the pointy end, so people that work in distribution centres, um, for example, who, who deal with truck drivers on an on a hourly basis, there should be some training for them so that they understand. Schedulers obviously have, have quite specific obligations in and around speeding. So make sure that you don't um, give a driver a, a, you know, a book of business for the day that, that is going to mean that he's going to have to speed in order to, to make the various um, calls that he's been described, required to make. So yeah, um, training is important. The make appropriate resources and processes available to minimise risks in relation to the maintenance of vehicles. Um, I spoke a little bit about that earlier on. Um, and establish processes for considering and responding to information about incidents, hazards and risks. So 
I mean, I use the, 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 the word whistleblower. I mean, make sure that you do have um, somewhere for people to go if they want to make um, an anonymous complaint, or not an anonymous complaint, but they want to make a, um, a comment or alert you um, as to something that might be going on um, that you need to know about. And then finally, um, what else can I do? Um, attain specific advice, not necessarily from a lawyer, but you know, there are plenty of consultants out there who are um, providing advice now in relation to chain of responsibility and helping people develop um, compliance policies. Obviously, review your own policies and procedures. Um, are they going to um, minimise or eliminate the risks that, that, that have been thrown up by um, your risk assessment? Review all contracts with drivers and transport operators. Um, do they incentivise or require breaches? Um, and consider tying payment incentive to HVNL compliance. So um, this was actually something that was raised by a judge in a, in a case a couple of years ago. Uh, maybe you could refuse to pay, um, he thought, um, an operator who was non-compliant with the chain of responsibility. I don't know how well that would go down, um, but that's what a judge thought. So look, that's all I really had to say. I know we've only got um, four minutes by my count um, to go, and I think we do finish, unfortunately, promptly at, at three. Um, I'm happy to take questions in the time that remains, and then I think, Jerome, people can uh, still fire questions to you and you can pass them on to me, is that right? That's exactly right, and we certainly welcome them. So are there any other questions that did in the in the last couple of minutes before we wrap? Um, yes, I've got a good one here. Uh, one around the container mass. So you mentioned the slide a bit further back around container. How does that relate to the issues of um, containers coming from ports being put on trucks? So what can a, what can a driver do in that case? Um, in well, um, that's that that is. Um, an interesting uh, question. What can a driver do? Um, a driver can only really, I suppose, establish to the extent that he can um, that the weight of the container is is within the weight that he is authorised to load. Um, if he um, if he's told that it is and he's produced and some evidence um, is produced. Sorry, where is that slide? There it is. Um, if uh, if, he's, if some evidence is produced, um, then I think that's really all he can be expected to do. There's another issue um, which relates to how well the goods are secured within the container. Um, now that's, a, that's another really difficult one and there's nothing, I, I think, um, that the driver can do to ascertain whether the goods in the container that's being loaded onto his vehicle are properly secured. Now there will be, you know, there are chain of responsibility ramifications for that if it turns out that the, the goods aren't secured in that container, even if they've been packed in, in Vietnam, um, for example, by someone who doesn't know anything about the chain of responsibility. So look, that's another um, important piece um, behind uh, all of this that, that people will need to, I think, think about. So yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're in, a, in a business that imports products from overseas, you do have an obligation to make sure that, that whoever's packing those containers, wherever they're packing them, um, is aware of the requirements for container packing in Australia. Excellent. I think that's all. Thank you, Jeff. I just want to say, uh, excellent presentation, fantastic answer to the questions. So thank you very much for your time today, Jeff. That's my pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for, for dialing in, and thank you, Jerome and Rosemary, for, for putting it on. Thank you so much. And Jeff, did you want to just pop past to the last two slides so that um, we can just have Shall a quick we? at I totally yeah. can. So there we are. Yes, and there's your contact details, which is awesome. That mug. And, and then the last slide is that one, the next event. Yes, we've got the next <laughs> event, haven't we, Jerome? We do indeed. So looking forward to ANCAP presenting, talking about five-star cars. So probably a bit of a different audience to those who we have online at the moment. Interesting. And Jeff, just one last click to the last slide, which is about our conference. We would like to draw our audience attention to the exciting event of the conference that's coming up on the 28th, the 28th Australian Road Research Board International Conference in 2018, and it will be held in Brisbane next April. And the theme is Next Generation Connectivity. So that's going to be awesome, isn't it, Jerome? Of course it will, Rosemary. 
And thank you to our audience. We'd love for you to fill out the survey so that we can find out uh, what you like and continually improve. Thanks so much, Jeff and Jerome. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.